familiar with the TV show Cheers? Cheers has that know-it-all postman, Cliff Clavin. It's a little known fact yeah. that, <laughs> right? Dot, dot, dot. He's always has to show something that he knows. A, a gentleman that I was dating really loved competitive games and loved Trivial Pursuit. He would get incredibly competitive during miniature golf. <laughs> making chess. I know. You I know. dated this guy? <laughs> we all have those. <laughs> yes, we do, actually. And it made me think about people who pursue learning for the sake of learning and then the people who just want to know. It's more a learning process and it is a knowing process as it always comes back to relationships. Yep. That's a moment and an opportunity for connection. I'm the individual that's like stained glass, rock climbing, baking, sign language. I'm going to jump into it wholeheartedly. I love learning about things and that's the expanse of knowledge as opposed to the limited acquisition and possession of knowledge. And there's an excitement in what one can learn. I'm like, Me too. Me too. I've, I've got some silly like smiles going. Welcome to Simply Enough. This is Zachary and Elizabeth, and thanks for tuning in. If you're liking our podcast, we'd love it if you'd share with your friends and family. And then rate and review to raise our visibility and spread the message of enoughness. We love you. And remember, you are simply enough. Just as you are. Period. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Simply Enough. I'm Mr. Zachary Leonard. <laughs> and I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ignacio. Uh, <laughs> I know we're giggling. We always have a little pregame episode chat and it's just a it's just an opportunity for us to connect as friends and and touch base and see how the other ones are doing and inevitably right before we click record uh, we get the giggles and that's what comes through right at the beginning of our episode. So <laughs> a nice little way to kickstart our episodes. Uh you know that we all have that closet that you kind of like push stuff in and then you close yes. the door and you like never see anything ever again. Yes. Uh, but I was going through that because uh, I have a visitor coming to Chicago soon and I was pulling some things out and I found our board games box. Right. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know about you. I found some pieces of trivial pursuit and I, I had never really been like the biggest fan of trivial pursuit. I just not one of those games that I enjoy necessarily, but it made me think about uh, simply enough because I was, I recalled a, a gentleman that I was dating and <laughs> bear with me as I tell the story, a gentleman that I was dating who really loved competitive games and loved trivial pursuit. It's like he would get incredibly competitive during miniature golf or putt, putt, like <laughs> making chess. <laughs> I know like making sure that every stroke was counted and that, you know, if you missed and you went into the water, you'd have to add a stroke, like just really loved the, the competition. Bowling was a whole nother adventure. Like, oh my God, just the way that you could suck fun out of bowling. I have no idea, but and you I dated this guy. <laughs> we, we all have those. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. Actually. <laughs> right? Yes, we do. Upon reflection, we're like, wait mm -hmm. a minute. Uh, anyway, he loved Trivial Pursuit, right? Because this was an opportunity for him to showcase all of the things that he knew, right? Mm -hmm. That this was this was the jeopardy of, of his time and his ability. So I hated playing. One, because when questions get answered, I do, I freeze up mentally. I am now aware of whether or not I've, I scored the pie piece for our team, and just all of that associated with it. And I just didn't really ever like Trivial Pursuit. Suit. And then I didn't like being on his team because I knew how competitive he would get and the intensity with which, you know, you needed to answer everything correctly. And, and that meant we were going to get a pie piece. And if we didn't, then I was the worst partner and all of that stuff. So I just never really enjoyed playing Trivial Pursuit with him. Anyway, the point of all of this is I found out having dated him for a while that he would study the cards. No, he would get no. the box. Yes. Yes. He would get the box out whenever he had some free time and would like read them and ask himself if he knew what the answer was. So he'd like quiz himself and then they became flashcards so that the next time we'd play Trivial <laughs> Pursuit. <laughs> yes. Okay. So it wasn't necessarily Sorry. like, right. <laughs> and this is so contrary to me, as you know, I'm the, the individual that's like stained glass I want to know what that's like. So I take the class and I get the materials and I like want to figure it out and how to do that. And it's the same with rock climbing and baking and sign language and all these things. Like, I want to know about it. I'm going to jump into it wholeheartedly. I'm going to, I want to get my hands dirty. I want to figure this out. And, and I want to, I want to excel and learn all the pieces associated with it. Whereas just in stark contrast, he literally would just memorize the cards right for this moment. And it made me think awesome. about this. <laughs> what a, what a, <laughs> awesome. Sorry. 
Sorry. <laughs> so I'm sure people are like, well, how does this connect with simply enough? And it made me think about the idea of, of people who learn and like pursue learning. And I'm using myself as that example for the sake of learning, like wanting to know, wanting to get into it, wanting to understand. And then the people who just want to know. And he was the kind of person that would just espouse that information whenever he could, insofar as it he felt like it made him look better or that made him look smarter or that he could win trivial pursuit and then he could hold that over people and whatnot. And we were just <laughs> such, I know, as of, yeah, good for you, buddy. But um, because at life's end in our deathbed, <laughs> we think, damn it, I wish I knew more at Trivial Pursuit. I got it. Okay. I'm with you here. <laughs> oh my gosh. A really quick tangent. So that the the other piece of this that made me that made me giggle is that I had forgotten that Trivial Pursuit fans know that there's a genus edition. I always thought it was called the genius edition. And that was such a fight when it came up that I called it the genius edition. And he stopped and he's like, what did you call it? I'm like, the genius <laughs> edition. He's like, you mean genius? And I'm like, no, I mean genius. And he's like, there's no genius. And then we kind of go back and forth. And I'm thinking, well, no, the genius edition is like the really harder questions. And I'm going into that place, of course, because I want to know about it. Mm -hmm. And then in his mind, I look even dumber. But uh, anyway, anyway, the point of all of this is just thinking about this idea of knowing versus learning. And here I was just in a moment of reverie and remembrance of this person who really just studied this information just to be able to say that he knew it. Mm -hmm. And then what that did for me, because then I had all of those feelings of doubt and insecurity and whatnot, because I didn't know, whereas I wanted to learn. And that wasn't necessarily valuable to him, or it wasn't a currency that served us during trivial pursuit. And what, anyway. what an opportunity lost though, seems to me what he values is the acquisition and the possession of knowledge mm -hmm. and the acquisition and possession of data, as opposed to the utilization of it, mm -hmm. or even purely the experience of it, of, mm -hmm. of the learning process, yep. as opposed to the end game outcome of the acquisition and possession of knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe he doesn't feel it's opportunity lost because that's what he values. So I'll, I'll admit that what I'm thinking about is my own bias and my own value judgment, which is, as it always comes back to relations and relationships, yep. which is what an opportunity lost uh, that here he is spending so much time studying these index cards of trivial pursuit to acquire that when he lost out on any joy of the experience of a relationship mm -hmm. with you, of being mm -hmm. mindful and present and being a human being as opposed to being a computer or walking robot with a pulse, um, <laughs> you know, walking around with all of this knowledge. In a prior episode, we um, talked about just ask. So, so that's one way of, re of relating as opposed to thinking for somebody else or mm -hmm. somebody thinking for us, just ask. Yep. That's a moment and an opportunity for connection. Well, it's just funny how, again, in this scenario to that very same point, I wonder in conversation, is it all about for him, what he knows and mm -hmm. what he can explain to you as opposed to asking you, mm -hmm. um, or I don't know, learning along the way with you. I, I say that, especially there might be people who are more comfortable, even in their earnest intent of relating is that they show up with as much data that they can spew. And, um, and th the thought process is, well, we're having a conversation and I'm teaching you something or I'm imparting on you what I know, and this is how I'm relating to you, mm -hmm. but that's not learning about the other person. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. showing what one knows. Mm -hmm. And that's different. We Stumbling. were no longer invited to join these certain friends that would host these game nights. So think about connection and opportunity lost because his energy was so about being the one who knew mm -hmm. that the, the true opportunity of somebody getting a question right and then being able to explain what they know about it or how they know it and really learning about your friends or your partner or whoever, and then taking not only what you learn from them factually or data, but also about who they are, what their interests are and how they knew it. Maybe there's a story with, with which they, they got that information. 
all of those opportunities were lost because he was so intent on being right and winning and mm -hmm. showing what he knew that not only did he and I lose opportunities to connect, but we also lost opportunities to connect with our friends Absolutely. And, and, and learn with them. So to your point, even more so the pieces of the story that are important demonstrate that that energy that he brought into it had some collateral damage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's about, and oftentimes I'll say that it, it's, it's likely I'll say this with empathy, perhaps a place coming from a place of insecurity where one has to show up with knowing mm -hmm. to feel that one upmanship when, like I said, in a previous episode, I love being the dumbest person in the room. Yeah. I, I love learning about things and mm -hmm. I don't need to know, and I don't need to be the expert. And again, actually, as we joke about uh, woman splaining or mansplaining on this podcast, this is a sharing of ideas and this is a sharing of what we think and know and have discovered on our journey, but it's more a learning process and it is a knowing process, which is why I always love to hear your take on, mm -hmm. on the same thing that we're talking about. And, and, um, many times it's similar and many times it's um, different and other times it's similar, but with a different nuance. And, and that's the expanse of knowledge as opposed to the limited acquisition and, pos and possession of knowledge. Um, you know, I had a patient who knew that my uh, daughter was at the time applying for schools and then got into the school that she wanted to. And, and this patient asked me, Oh, well, you know, what school did she get into? And I, I told him, and mind you, this had been like, as everybody knows, a year long process in terms of the research into the schools that are going to be on the, on the college list of applications, that kind of stuff. And then this school that uh, my daughter um, applied to, she applied early. So she, mm -hmm. it was the school she wanted to go to. And so she did a lot of research on the school and yes, I, I helped her along this journey and, and, and this process. So it's so funny that like the, his follow-up visit when he said, oh, you know, that congratulations again, that your daughter got into that school. Did you know? And then he started to be, you're so young, Zachary. I don't know. Do you, are you familiar with the TV show Cheers? Oh yeah. Well, I was just talking about this the other day. Okay. Yes. So Cheers has that, that know-it-all postman, Cliff Clavin, Cliff, right? Yeah. It's a little known fact yeah. that, <laughs> right, dot, dot, dot. And so he's always has to show something that he knows. And he always has to pepper a conversation by sneaking in some little data point or, or little trivia knowledge that he knows, even if it's esoteric to the conversation, mm -hmm. or even if it's a part of the conversation, it's not a means to relate. It's, it's more like, and poor thing, again, it's probably from his insecurity that Cliff Clavin feels the need to say what he knows, <laughs> but it's just awkward and it's not engaging or inviting. It's just kind of a, okay, are you done with your data points? <laughs> and that was the kind of thing with this patient who, God bless him, is trying to relate, but it's just so funny that it's like, well, did you know this about this school? And I, and mm -hmm. um, I learned this about this school. And it was cute because I'm sure what he did was in his wanting to relate to me he did, I don't know, some research and, and looking into the school um, that my daughter's going to. But quite frankly, actually, the conversation was slight boring and even off-putting because it was just like, well, did you know that they have this residential college system? Yes, yes, I I do know that because we've <laughs> researched it for a year, which is why my daughter chose this school. You know what I mean? But, it, but it's coming to a conversation with knowing and throwing out data points as opposed to relating or even asking, why did your daughter choose? I yep. heard, you know, this about the residential college. What did your daughter think about this residential mm -hmm. college system? You know, it's, it's a different means of communication and mm -hmm. conversation, being open to learning mm -hmm. as opposed to knowing. And again, even this podcast, rather than knowing like, aha, I have this figured out. It's more just, here's a story I have for you, Zachary. And this is what I learned from it. And this was my takeaway. What is your takeaway? Oh, and it expands knowledge as opposed to this finite limited possession of knowledge. And if I may ask, like as an educator, in some ways, it's kind of how we've been taught to learn in school. I, I, I'm not blaming schools. How else can one measure that, you know, a student, especially in youth, 
grasp the knowledge of that subject matter, right? But so much of, at least back in my day, I actually do think that it's it's shifting mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. in terms of experiential learning mm-hmm. and and citizen science, meaning mm-hmm. the the application of data as opposed to just the spewing out of yep. of the memorized facts. But but there still is that component of rather than exploring what one has learned mm-hmm. or applying what mm-hmm. one has learned, just regurgitate back to me in essay form or multiple choice form, choose the right answer. Mm-hmm. Whereas how much in life is there truly a right and a wrong? People will question this even morally, right? Like there's, yeah. there are grays, whether we like it or not, there's actually grays and, and the feeling that one has to be right. And if one is right, then one is better. And so that's how one is better. So one has the upper hand, so one will feel more secure. And so, you know, one holds the room and commands mm-hmm. the room more by being right, mm-hmm. as opposed to, well, here's the knowledge that I come with. What do you have to mm-hmm. add to the equation? change my mind, you know, mm-hmm. teach me mm-hmm. more. Mm-hmm. Does that make as sense? You, it totally makes sense. And as you're, as you were talking, you, you established the potential that this patient was wanting to connect. And I can't help but wonder if the connection will be deeper if you start with a question. And the reason why Absolutely. I, th- why I throw that question out there is because I mean, you brought up education and there's definitely evidence in pedagogical approaches that show that if you start with a question, the learning will be deeper. Mm. So one example is a KWL chart. So this is what you know, this is what you want to know. And then when you finish what you've learned, and usually that, that type of, of structure is done at the beginning of a, a lesson or a unit. So let's say you're, you're, you're talking about bread. Maybe it's a whole lesson on bread. Okay. This is what we know about bread. Uh, this is what we want to know about bread. And then when you're done studying, then, okay, this is what we've learned. The W is actually the most critical point, especially for the teacher, but not, also for the students, because you start with a question. What do you want to know? Well, I want to know how bread is, is formed and, and what activates the bread to rise and what other countries cook using bread and what is or what are quintessential examples of bread in various cultures and communities. And you're, you're always starting with a question. And if you ask the question and you're sincere in wanting to know how much deeper your learning will be because you've gotten to start with a question rather than coming in and saying, this is all that I know about bread. Well, you're not really going to learn anything that W that part in the middle is the most important part. It's inquiry based education. And that's why I'm connecting a lot with what you're saying, especially as an educator is yes, maybe your patient. And even in, if we assume the best of anybody that's person splaining man or woman splaining, (laughs) um, If there is a sincere attempt to connect, maybe thinking about what will offer the the deeper connection, coming in with what you know, or coming in with with a question. Mm -hmm. What what you're open to, because there is that connection, because in coming in with a question, it's not so much what you know, it's actually admitting what you don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, And then it becomes kind of a journey together. What type of learning did you call it? Inquiry based inquiry-based learning. So mm-hmm. in med school, there was a shift uh, right when I was in med long time ago now. So, so it's already <laughs> shifted, mm-hmm. but it was purely at first didactic, like here's the yep. reading topics and here's mm-hmm. the lecture. And then here's the test. Well, incorporated into that, as I was coming into medical school, there was a shift towards PBL problem-based learning. So I mean, you still have to know that you, you still have mm-hmm. to know facts and you still have to know science, but then, uh, there was small group problem-based learning where it was a case study of a patient. And I know law school is, is similar mm-hmm. this way. There's a case study and from that patient, whether it's a fictitious patient or whether it's actually going into the hospital and, you know, we go as a group and we, you know, interview a patient and learn about this patient. That's how we learn the application of what we know. And it actually exponentially forces us Mm. to explore other, what Mm. we call differential diagnoses. Well, this could be diabetes. What do we know about diabetes? Okay. But it also could be this. And so now we have to learn about this. Well, this lab value can indicate this, but what else can the lab value indicate? Okay. Well, now we have to learn about this other diagnosis. So it's very experiential it's very expansive, which is what we want learning to be, right? Again, it's not limited, reductive, 
possession of what we know, it's yes. And what can we build upon? So I, I think about my son, Mikey, who as he's really coming into his own in terms of possible career paths, which I, I tell him, please don't decide right now. You know, you're 16. And, <laughs> right. and, and for those who who think that one needs to decide now at 16, mm-hmm. I, I don't know how that could be possible. But anyway, but at least he's like, well, but I like government and politics. I really liked that class. And I never thought I would like that class. So let me do this. And, you know, I really like this about science. And and so he's always liked science. Thank you, Mrs. Warner in lower school, Iolani. Thank you for that exposure that he's always recognized that he's loved science. And so there was kind of in his mind, this dialogue direct path of like, well, then of course I'm going to be a doctor, not by my pushing, yeah, quite the opposite actually. But then as he's going into uh, junior year, he's doing some research with an independent research project. And it just amazes me to see how different, and this is such an important separate message, which is our children are truly their own selves and not an extension of us as parents. That's that's a tangent, but a very important one that I want to say. The reason is because he loves science and he loves the research side of science. Whereas like, honestly, I roll my <laughs> eyes and I'm like, well, I had to do it because it was my major and you know, it's a necessary evil kind of thing. But he He loves it. And the expansion of his mind as he was telling me, well, this is the project that he wants to do. And and the reason why is because he looked into this research and the scientific literature and it it made him ask, well, what if this and what if that? Mm -hmm. And so his mind was so expansive or expanded and so excited and engaged Uh by not just the knowledge of, well, I know that Mm -hmm. non-tuberculous mycobacterium like the humidity and boom, he knows that answer. It actually spawned further questions that engaged him and interested him into further research. So it's not just about what one knows, it's what one can learn. Mm -hmm. And there's an excitement in what one can learn and and the recognition of what we don't know. So let's learn about it. I have to say also, again, in the field of medicine, you know, again, love being the dumbest person in the room. I love going um, to national conferences and just sitting in the audience. And I'm just in awe of the the people on the panel. Unfortunately, in in, in orthopedic surgery, it's a mantle. Um, <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. it's, it's all men on the panel. Um, there's a shift in that though. But anyway, sorry. But here it, it's just so amazing and, and inspiring to like hear from these world-renowned, you know, people and what we learn, or at least what I learned the most from and why I learned the most from them is because they are not afraid, uh, most most of them, and, and that's why they have risen to the forefront of orthopedics because yes, they they are on on the leading edge of innovation. And in order to be on the leading edge of innovation, one has to have more of an expansive mind of what what don't we know? So let's explore or this, you know, let's try this new technique. And what they actually often share where I learn the most is when things have not worked out Mm -hmm. and they share the mistakes they made or these new techniques that they've tried and didn't work out or the reason why this one technique worked worked well in this new technique of surgery is because they learned that these old ways didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't a sitting in and settling in of the complacency Mm -hmm. of the knowledge that one has and one knows, but the willingness to look at what we don't know and explore that. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. in not even in the national conferences, even in academia, in at the university level, or even, even, I won't even say um, formal academia, even in at the hospital level, at your local hospital, very often the departments have something called an m M&M conference. And no, we're not talking about one of my favorite uh, <laughs> candy coated chocolates. Um, M&M stands for morbidity and mortality. Okay. And that is where, again, a case that might not have gone the way that we wanted to, hence morbidity, 
and or mortality is actually used as a case study for all of us Mm -hmm. to explore and learn without judgment and thank God for those attendings, which are professor, Mm -hmm. you know, professor like level, the attendings that are willing to share those, those cases um, that didn't go as well and thus are being presented in M&M conference, but that's for the greater good Mm -hmm. because without, or at least it's supposed to be without judgment or shame, it is a collective learning of what to do and what not to do, mm-hmm. as opposed to just a spewing of the what is known. Mm-hmm. You started talking about Mikey, and you also we, we talked about how this relates to education. I firmly believe that a true sense of wonder, which I think is what we're talking about, is so rich and pure in children. And even when they, what if this, and what is that? And, and, and who is that? And how does this work? And it exists so purely and, and sincerely and one way or another, it evolves as we grow up. And I think that the educational system, and I'll admit does a disservice to that childlike wonder and that openness. And I'm relieved to hear you say that all the way up into adulthood, there are examples of people still coming from a place of wanting to know more and saying, what else is out there? Are there better practices? Are there, are there better methods? And how, how can we learn from what we did? and maybe surprised us. And, and so I think I took a little bit more of a a skeptical view that adults don't ask the questions. And I'm relieved to hear that, that they do, because you shared very beautifully in a previous episode that you live, some people live with a fear of embarrassment or, or fear, any other fear, but you live a fear of regret and going after something and, and not wanting to, to regret what you didn't do. I think I live, in addition to living in a place of gratitude, constant gratitude, in a place of wonder. I generally just want to know. So just you right now talking about all of that, I have so many more questions of what that looks like. And have you experienced that? Now, see, I'm going into a place of coming from from questions and and maybe I have my own thoughts or, or connections or maybe even some knowledge. But I, I'm smiling at just my own reflection out loud of how that sense of curiosity, wonder, openness... Uh, asking questions, wanting to learn is very sincere and deep rooted in me. And it wasn't in the guy that I was dating. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow, maybe I didn't see it initially, but eventually we did. So, so this is a long roundabout way of saying, yes, it does make sense. And also I'm enjoying knowing that adults or not even just our medical profession, but just adults can still live in that place of, of connection and deeper understanding, deeper knowledge by just starting with an open-ended question. So yes, it totally makes sense. Does, did I get yes. there? Okay. Yeah. And it's it's funny how even in what seemingly is the best of intentions and best of circumstances, still the the armor, the shield. And I, mm-hmm. I, I use that specifically because actually Brene Brown talks <laughs> yes. about uh-huh. being a knower versus a learner mm-hmm. and that the knower in the holding tight and the possession of, of facts and thinking that it's the facts, the facts mm-hmm. that makes the man, that it's the facts that, that give the person value. That's actually armor that is keeping somebody from relating with mm-hmm. others. Well, I'm thinking of um, somebody that I know that um, of all places is in a Bible study group. She has grown up in Mm -hmm. faith Mm -hmm. and has her own feelings of uh, relationship with her faith, but in her desire to explore more uh, and deeper for herself. Uh, Mm -hmm. She is in Bible study group Mm -hmm. uh, and she loves the, the people and, and is, is so glad that she is taking this deeper step for her, but it is, it's somewhat new territory, Mm -hmm. you know, a formal Bible study group. So she's in this uh, Bible study group. And, you know, so my friend mentioned that actually she's quite intimidated. And I I found that strange. I'm like, it's a Bible study (laughs) group. (laughs) You know, if if we're going to be talking about what I would think would be uh, as Mm -hmm. welcoming an environment as there possibly could be, one would hope it would be a, Mm -hmm. a faith-based group. Um, Mm -hmm. and let's remove the fact that it's, you know, Bible and therefore Mm -hmm. Christian. I'm just saying that, you know, theoretically this group, uh, of whatever faith it could be, one would think that it would be inclusive and warm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the last word I would have expected, you know, in, in joining uh, a faith-based community would be to feel intimidated. Mm -hmm. 
that was just my natural uh, inclination and assumption. And what my friend mentioned was like, well, it's because she's new to this, not only the group, but she's other than formal, you know, classes that she's had as a child, she's kind of somewhat new to the Bible. And so she's intimidated because other members of the group can quote scripture Mm -hmm like reciting the alphabet and take pride in knowing all of the books of, you know, the, the individual books within the, the Bible mm-hmm. um, by heart and can, you know, speed name, name them within a minute and, and alphabet, <laughs> alphabetize by memory or, you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit. And I just thought to myself, well, that's not even the point though. The point isn't to show knowledge. The point is to, you share a, a love of that shared faith and share a love of each other if that's what the faith is based on. If the theoretical dogma and doctrine of that faith, which I as a Christian, I will say that if this is a Bible, you know, Bible study group, yes, that's what it's based on is is love. Then how in any way would the showing of knowledge as opposed to the sharing of the experience and the sharing of the connection that just to me seems to be the actual antithesis of the intent of not only that group itself, but misses the message of the entire faith, Mm -hmm. to be honest. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I can imagine this would be difficult for your friend who is approaching this with a sense of openness and a sense of wanting fellowship and connection with similarly minded individuals and and hoping to find a group of people that feels similarly about morals and ethics and life and and spirituality and I know you started off by saying that's not just germane to this particular group I similarly when I started to get into theater in high school showed up for my first audition actually there was like a rehearsal for the audition and immediately was well what shows have you been in and and what shows have you seen and and there was like a a need to demonstrate some what I knew and what I had experienced and and almost go tit for tat with these individuals so that I could be a part of the group. You know, as we've talked openly, like I love performing and it's been such a integral part of my life. And I've met some of the most amazing people because of it. And yet somehow I managed to make through that initial distaste, which was, oh, I don't like this. I don't like this feeling of like, I have to prove to you what I know, or I'm not quote unquote as valuable because I don't know X, Y, and Z. And that can actually do a disservice to the intention of a Bible study group, or in this case, a performing arts group, when truly at its heart, I would think it would be about deeper connection. And so it's disheartening. It was a disheartening experience for me because it almost killed what would have been a a wonderful path in my life had it not been for some other people. So I, I, which is interesting. If I may, if I may add in scenario, it did start apparently with questions, but this is really where one has to weigh whether one is the asker of the question or the receiver of the question. But if one is the asker of the question, just because something's coming out with a question mark at the end Mm -hmm. doesn't mean necessarily that that's really um, the invitation to learn more about the other person. Because sometimes even though it's a sentence that ends with an inflection up (laughs) and even ends with a question mark if it's written. Mm -hmm. So even if it's a question, is it really the intent to Mm -hmm. learn more about what that answer is? Or is it a okay, you answer that question so that now I can answer the question yeah. back. Yes. And then that's where it becomes a tit for tat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's a really good point. I hadn't even thought about that. So it's not that. just a perfunctory question, right? right. Like, like my, my patient could probably come back to me and say, well, I started off by asking about, you know, <laughs> oh, so your daughter <laughs> chose X school? Yeah, but that's just so that you can say, because I did some research on that school yep. and this is what I learned, right? So then that, that intent of the question wasn't really about learning of what the answer is, as opposed to really just a segue into the diatribe of what one knows. I think many of us have that internal barometer of knowing the question that's coming at us. Is it actually open and genuine in its intent to know and connect, or if there is an agenda behind it? And I think freshmen in high school 
I knew right away that this was an attempt to size me up and figure out how he's going to fit in. And I got the lead role in the show. So ha ha ha, take that guys. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, you're absolutely right. Yeah. A question can be really masqueraded uh, as a tit for tat or the beginnings of a potential tit for tat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And even, and again, back to that patient and in this mm-hmm. scenario too, the tit for tat might not even necessarily be with mal intent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It just might be that person's, shall I say, social awkwardness. That's that person's capacity mm-hmm. and idea of connection. But again, if it's a, I ask you, now you ask me, so then I can show my answer. Yep. That's not as deep a connection as it could have been mm-hmm. based on the not only the depth of the question, but the openness and the willingness to then listen. Mm-hmm and learn. Mm-hmm. Well, there's I'm- hearing where you hear the, there's hearing where you hear the pitch tones of, of the sounds that are coming out of another person's mouth. And then there's listening. I will say for the, the guy that I was talking about at the beginning, you, you brought up Renee Brown and, and an armor or like a knower was really a front because there was a lot of insecurity there. There really was it a sincere attempt to connect with other people and really just not not a discernment about which ways will actually produce the outcomes with which he wanted. And now I can look back and feel some empathy for him and Mm -hmm. see like, he really did just want friends and, and a partner and to feel included and whatnot. Just the way in which he went about doing it was not, didn't produce the outcomes that he wanted. And also did establish us an armor so that when we didn't get the invitation back, it was, well, they're not our people anyway. And blah, blah, blah. You know, like there was, we, as if we said in previous episodes, there wasn't really that opportunity to look back upon ourselves and see like, what are we doing um, that, that is impacting this. So for him, it was very much armor and it was protection that was hiding a, a true sense to connect that he just, he just didn't know about he didn't know how to go about doing it in a way that was going to provide the deeper connections that he really did want. Which is so funny because when we talk about armor, one thinks, is that armor that's protecting one from somebody else that can harm when, or instead, is it actually an encasement or a shield or a blockade keeping the one who's holding the armor the one who's feeling the need to be the knower, Mm -hmm. actually not being protected from the other person, but actually barricading himself or herself from connecting with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that's why and where vulnerability is the key, right? It really is. It's the soft spots. It's the cracks. It's the wounds that actually where we can let others in. Mm -hmm. I think Rumi might've said that. I think that, you know, um, rather than where I'm paraphrasing now, I know these weren't exactly Rumi's words, but it's just kind of like, you know, um, it's the cracks in the armor where we let the light in. Mm -hmm. I thank you for indulging me in my story to, to kick off this episode, because I unabashedly live comfortably in a place of wonder, knowing that I love also being vulnerable. And I am saying that out loud because I'm coming to realize that I never had actually considered that as, as a driving, uh, a driving force in my life is, and I, I can see that in many aspects of my life. I want to know more about people. I want to know more about topics. I want to know more about cultures that that's always just kind of been who I am. That's, that's the way in which I choose to go forward in life. It's interesting that I did date that person when you think about it, but cause we couldn't have been, why it's a journey. We yeah. get like that. That's yeah. Yeah. And um, it just makes me think as you were saying that, um, you know, Oprah, she has this, um, she had a magazine mm-hmm. and um, she always had at the end uh, because she was, you know, the editor or whatever. But anyway, she always had at the end, uh, like the last page um, was Oprah's page and mm-hmm. it was titled What I Know For Sure. And there are always life lessons and she's, you know, so, so pensive and reflective. So there, it was always a wonderful read and always um, uh, thought provoking and often very heartwarming. And the only thing that I can say though about that, as much as I loved pretty much each and every piece that she wrote for that is uh, if I, if I were to write it and could tweak the title, I, I don't know how one can say what I know for sure 
period, as if lesson learned, we're done. Yeah. It's it could be, and I and I think one can wholeheartedly feel it and believe it, and therefore authentically mean it. What I know for sure for now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm open to the possibility that what I know for sure now I'm wrong. And so enlighten me. And when I say enlighten me, I don't, I don't say that as a challenge, like really prove it to me, you know, and mm-hmm. get defensive. It's more like I'm open mm-hmm. to, to knowing either the subtle nuances or the big flaws in my thinking. Mm-hmm. And either as long as I approach it with openness, I might still remain in the same mm-hmm. belief and quote knowledge but without confirmatory bias, just being open to the possibilities, that's learning Mm -hmm. as opposed to knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think about Grace uh, as she's embarking on, you know, her college career. And again, uh, with my son as a right, as a junior now, not rising junior, as a, as a junior in high school. And so he's looking into um, schools and what he's looking into in terms of uh, research projects because that seems to have really mm-hmm. caught his fancy. And I just marvel with wonder of all that there is to learn. Who cares about knowing? And honestly, who cares about being right? Sometimes right is overrated, <laughs> right? I uh, Sometimes right is overrated, you know, uh, it, arguments, think arguments, right? Mm-hmm. And, and um, you know, argument with a loved one. God bless Dave, my husband. I mean, there was, I, I forget what stupid little thing it was about. Um, I don't know how to load the dishwasher. I don't know, something stupid. <laughs> and I was like, so insistent, you know, he's like, well, you know, th- this isn't, you know, worth, this isn't worth fighting about. I mean, I don't really think there's a right or wrong. So okay, you know, we can do it this way, or okay, you can think it that way. Or even you and I, Zachary, it's like, well, you know, we can agree to disagree on this Mm -hmm. part. It's, Mm -hmm. it's not about putting all of the weight in getting the right answer. Multiple choice B. There's so little in life that's actually a right or wrong. Mm -hmm. I know people are going to debate me on that. And I get it because I, I struggled with that polarity and duality uh-huh. of, of life, including morals and ethics. But I, you know, I've, I've come to learn that uh, life is more expansive and thus far more in the gray and far more in the middle than the extremes. Mm-hmm. Couldn't agree with you more. And I think back to my first couple of years as an administrator where I felt like I needed to be right or that I needed to be the leader, which meant I needed to know all the answers and just the different experiences and opportunities or for deeper connection that were missed because I came at the conversation with a teacher or a staff member needing to be the one that won or the one that was right. Yes. And then ultimately learning that those opportunities of truly connecting with somebody and learning from them and then growing together were stronger. And that if I were in a conversation with somebody, maybe a faculty member, and I recognized that they needed to be right in that moment, then just also stepping back and saying, well, but what do I want in terms of my relationship with this person and time and some really moments that I wish I could change, but they are part of who I am, have helped me see exactly what you're saying, uh, which is very few times is it really about being right or wrong. And that many of those times when I felt the need to be right, I missed an opportunity for deeper connection. And also thinking about Oprah's last page and what I shared about the KWL, the know, want to know, and then what you learn, how much richer the connection with readers would it have been if there was a know what I know for sure for now, and then maybe a section of, well, what do I want to learn or what am I learning more about to then also give an indication that Oprah's ongoing learning, and then maybe an opportunity to cycle back on what she's learned about the things that she put early in an earlier um, episode or a magazine or issue. I don't know I'm a little all yeah, over the place. We but. see that. And even in what we think is hard and fast, the right answer. Mm-hmm. So take, I don't know, the number nine, there are many ways to get to the right answer. Two plus seven, five plus four, six plus three. So there's different ways to get to what is seemingly the right answer. So in being open to learning, as much as I I hang my hat on two plus seven, let's learn a little bit more about the five plus four or the six plus three. Um, because 
you know, there's number one, there's different ways to get to the right answer. And sometimes there isn't even a right answer. Mm -hmm. Now there might be a better answer for the time being or the Uh better answer for this situation or, or, or whatnot, but the, the need to be right or the acquisition and possession of knowing as opposed to the openness and the exploration and the expansiveness of Mm -hmm. learning how much richer life is that way. Amen. I learned so much from you. Same. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I could, it, you know, we're, it's a good thing that we, we don't have hours upon hours because I would sit here and I would just ask more. I would want to know more about the M&Ms and that process and what that's <laughs> like. And because I, I do, I just, I, I, I dig into the idea of learning more about people and who they are and you, because I'm, I'm not a physician and that world is so foreign to me it's even more intriguing and and you speak with such accessibility for individuals who don't come from that knowledge that i just want i it's a, i have to stop myself from wanting to like turn this into an interview where i'm asking you all these <laughs> questions so thanks for bearing with me but um i learned so much from you so thank you for being open to sharing who you are and also you write our episode summaries and you always start with a question and we've talked about this before that question question is open ended and also meant to connect even more so, are you, are you helping frame this podcast truly from a place of openness? Even if maybe you've listened to this episode and you disagree with us. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Which is totally okay. Absolutely. We, Not we, only is it okay, let us know yep. how, again, let us know how we can expand our mind, um, expand our view. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So listeners and viewers, are. yeah, connect with us ask us questions, but also give us your answers. Yeah. Yeah. And remember, you are simply enough just as you are period. period. I love you. Love you too.